Okay, good morning, everybody. So for today, we'll be discussing and we'll be continuing our discussion on the different specimen collection and handling um, requirements and procedures for clinical chemistry one. So again, good morning to everybody. So if you haven't, um, I hope you're already finished with the patient preparation, which will be included in your quiz next meeting, which is on... Um, which will be the second meeting for this week, okay? So for our next meeting for this particular week, you'll be having your quiz in this particular topic and also in your patient preparation. So please do prepare for that, okay? Please do prepare for that. So for today's discussion, I just want to uh, give you a rough um, overview of the things that we're going to discuss. So first and foremost, uh, we will be discussing about... Um, the different types of specimen or the different types of samples in clinical chemistry. So we're we'll just uh, going to have a brief discussion about this. At the same time, we're also going to talk about your method of collection. So some of these are actually very much familiar to you. We're actually just reviewing some of the topics. So I hope uh, most of you will be able to um, tune in and really listen uh, properly for, our, for all our discussion. And the third part, will be the collection tubes and devices, and then the, the different additives and the different um, anticoagulants that are found in your uh, test tubes or evacuated tubes. And finally, uh, we'll be having a review on the protocol of specimen collection, handling, processing, and transport, which will be a second part of this video, which will be given to you um, next meeting, okay, which will be given to you next meeting together with the chain of custody. Okay, so let's get started and discuss about the first one because our review for today will be quite long. But again, I hope that all of you will be able to catch up because most of the things that we're going to discuss today are just reiteration review from your PMLSP2 subject. Okay, so of course, <coughs> when we talk about your samples, Okay, there are different types of samples in the clinical chemistry laboratory. We have your blood, your urine, your cerebrospinal fluid, your parasynthesis fluid, and also your amniotic fluid. So all of these things can be measured in the clinical chemistry section, although um, among these five um, samples, the one very much common to the clinical laboratory or in the clinical chemistry section is your blood in the form of your serum. So your urine, your CSF, your parasynthesis fluid, and even your amniotic fluid, um, those will be discussed um, further in your analysis of urine and other body fluids. But for this particular morning, we're just going to have some, um, some discussion about the samples, which are also vital when it comes to their um, when it comes to their function and uses in the clinical chemistry section. So let's get started with the first one, and we're going to talk about your blood. When we say blood, there are actually three forms that we, we can use in the laboratory. It can be your whole blood, your plasma, and also your serum. So we're going to talk about them one by one. So when we say whole blood, okay, when you say whole blood, we use both the liquid portion and the, the, the cellular components of the blood. So your whole blood is composed of two, okay, your plasma and the cellular components of your plasma, which contains now your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and also your thrombocytes or your platelet. So please do remember that this particular sample does require um, this require blood collection into a vessel or into a test tube that contains your anticoagulant. So when we say anticoagulant, please remember this because I actually noticed that some of you are still having a hard time or are confused when it comes to the function of your anticoagulant. Remember that when you put an anticoagulant in a test tube or in a container, the specimen that you will have there will either be your whole blood, and if you centrifuge that, okay, dahil meron nga siyang anticoagulant because that particular tube contains your, your anticoagulant, when you centrifuge that specimen, you will get, okay, you will get your plasma. Okay, you will get your plasma, which we'll be discussing, uh, which will be discussed in a short while. So again, remember when we say whole blood, okay? Remember when we say whole blood, it is an it is um it is not clotted, okay? It is not clotted. You use your anticoagulant with this one. So your whole blood 
And the clinical chemistry section is usually being used for HPA1C or glycated hemoglobin, uh, which is used in the monitoring of diabetes. So please do take note. Okay, please do take note that when it comes to your whole blood, again, we use both the liquid portion, which is your plasma, and also your um, cellular component composed of your white blood cells, red blood cells, and also your thrombocytes or your platelets. Again, remember that when it comes to whole blood, we use your anticoagulant, anticoagulant that prevents the clotting or the formation of fibrin. Okay, the formation of your fibrin. It prevents the clotting through different mechanisms, which will also be discussed towards the end of this discussion. Now, moving forward, aside from your whole, whole blood, of course, we also have your plasma. So your plasma, okay, your plasma is actually the yellow or the 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 clear or the pale yellow um, liquid that you would see on top of your back red cell if you centrifuge your whole blood. So again, let's have that in mind that uh, your plasma was uh, yielded from your whole blood. So if you have your whole blood, it does have your anticoagulant preventing the clotting. So walang pamumuo ng dugo, there is no clotting that happened. If you centrifuge that, you will get your plasma. So your plasma again is an, it's normally a clear to slightly hazy pale yellow fluid or liquid that is separated from the cells when a blood in an anticoagulate, uh, anticoagulant tube was centrifuge. Please do remember that your plasma, your plasma still contains your fibrinogen. Sir, what is fibrinogen? Fibrinogen is one a coagulation factor, okay? Fibrinogen is one coagulation factor that is the substrate for your thrombin. Yung, your thrombin, okay, your thrombin is the one that will convert or the one that will activate, okay, your fibrinogen into becoming your fibrin. And if there is fibrin formation, there will be clotting. Merong pamumuo ng dugo. Pero, but, if you use your anticoagulant, the formation of your fibrin will be prevented in various mechanisms. For most of your anticoagulant, their mode of action is by chelating your calcium. So this will be the action of your EDTA, your sodium citrate, your potassium oxalate. So most of your anticoagulants, okay, most of your anticoagulant, why do we call them anticoagulant? Because they co prevent, they are anti what? anti or they prevent coagulation or the formation or the solidification of your blood through the formation of your fibrin. So they prevent coagulation, okay? They prevent coagulation by um, chelating your calcium, okay? By chelating your calcium. And secondly, uh, most specifically for your heparin, okay? Your heparin prevents coagulation. Your heparin is an anti-coagulant by um, inhibiting the action of your thrombin, okay? By inhibiting the action of your thrombin. So to cut the long story short, if we centrifuge your whole blood and it does contain your anticoagulant, whether that is an ADTA, a sodium, a, um, a sodium citrate, a potassium oxalate, or a sodium or lithium heparin, okay, when you centrifuge that, you will get your plasma and one protein okay one protein unique to plasma that cannot be found in your serum is your fibrinogen okay again that is your fibrinogen if we're going to talk about your coagulation factor your fibrinogen is actually your coagulation factor one again your fibrinogen is your coagulation factor one so for most of um our clinical chemistry uh, measurement, as you all know, we use as your serum. But, sir, why are we talking about plasma then? Because plasma is used for stat or other tests that requires fast turnaround time. So take, for example, your, your doctor requested for your electrolyte and it is a stat. They need the result immediately. So instead of waiting for five minutes, if you're using your thrombin, instead of using, uh, instead of waiting for fifteen to thirty, if you're using a red plastic tube, or instead of using thirty to sixty minutes before the blood clot, if you are using your red glass tube, you can simply use your uh green top tube. Okay, take nota. Only your green top tube, so that you can use that and you can 
yield, okay, you can get your plasma and measure that. And you can simply measure the electrolytes immediately without waiting for the complete clotting of your sample. Okay, for the complete clotting of your sample. So that's one thing that is uh, very good when it comes to your plasma. Okay, that's one thing that is very good when it comes to your plasma because, okay, your um within your plasma because okay because your um your sample doesn't need to wait for it to clot hindi na natin kailangan hintayin pa na mamuo we don't need to wait for the blood to completely clot before we can run the sample in the laboratory so that's the the second uh, sample that we are using in the laboratory your plasma now finally okay the one that is very much common and very much uh, widely used in the clinical chemistry section will be now your serum. So let's de uh, let's um, describe your serum first. So your serum is the liquid portion now of your clotted blood. So take for example, you collected your blood using a serum tube, using your red top, your orange top, or your gold top tube. If you centrifuge them, um, when you separate your uh, when your blood separate, you have on top of on the on the uppermost layer, you have your serum. And then you have your buffy coat containing your, your WBC and your, your platelet. And then below, you have your packed red cell. Remember, okay, remember that when it comes to your serum, it is also a clear pale yellow fluid, especially if your uh, um especially if your patients are fasting. Although if your patient did not fast, they it might appear hazy or cloudy due to the presence of uh, lipids, specifically your triglyceride in your sample. So the major difference between your plasma and your serum is that your serum does not contain your fibrinogen. Okay? Again, your serum does not contain your fibrinogen. Unlike your plasma, that's one, okay? Ha? That's one of their main differences. Okay? Number one is that your plasma contains fibrinogen, serum do not have your fibrinogen. Bakit wala na siyang fibrinogen? Why does your serum, uh, why is it that your serum doesn't have your fibrinogen anymore? Again, because this particular sample is clotted. So your fibrinogen was converted to fibrin, hence the formation of your clot in your blood. So your serum samples must be allowed to completely clot approximately 30 minutes to 60 minutes if you are using your, uh, your red glass tube uh, 15 to 30 if you're using your um, your red plastic and 5 minutes if you're using your orange top that contains your thrombin. Remember, okay? Remember everybody that when it comes to clot, uh, complete clotting time, okay, to complete clotting time, you need to allow the, the, the blood to clot completely to prevent the formation of your latent fibrin clot. So what's the, I know, what's the shenanigan with, uh, uh, that is related to your latent fibrin clot. Remember that your latent fibrin clot can cause, okay, again, remember that your latent fibrin clot can cause interferences when it comes to your measurement. Why? Because your latent fibrin clot can clog, okay, can clog your pipetors, your machine that can that can um, cause erroneous results in your samples, okay? So those are um, the different blood specimens that we can use. You can have your whole blood, your plasma, and your serum. So as for the information of everybody, uh, what is the most commonly used uh, sample among those three? It is your serum. But please take note that for most of the machines now, and for most of our reagents now, we can use your plasma, you can use your serum. But again, the million-dollar question is, sir, what would be the deciding factor uh, unto when I can use my serum and when can I use my plasma? Simple. Remember that in the establishment of your reference interval, we need to standardize the, um, the processing, the collection, and even the measurement of your sample. So if, if the reference value or if the reference interval you have in the laboratory was established using your serum, then it is best for your laboratory to use your serum. If you use your plasma, then it is best for your laboratory to use your plasma. If you use both, you use your serum or your plasma in establishing, okay? When you were establishing your reference interval, you use both your serum and you also use your plasma. Then you can use either, either specimen when it comes to your laboratory. Ganun lang siya kasimple. 
always remember that it will always depend upon how you establish your reference interval, including your fasting. I think I was able to mention that our um, last meeting in the patient preparation part. So when it comes to patient preparation, again, you can use, okay? Again, when it comes to patient preparation, you can use either um, what the, the fasting requirement that you use for in establishing, okay, the one that you use in, when you establish your reference interval, okay? So those are the blood specimen are, are the blood yeah, samples that we are using in the clinical chemistry section. Of course, um, quick sideline, okay, quick sideline discussion, we also use your, your, your urine. So remember that your urine is an ultrafiltrate of your plasma and it does consist of your urea and other organic and inorganic chemicals dissolved in your water or dissolved in your urine. So it is the second most common fluid of determination in the laboratory, second to blood, okay? Second to your blood. So your urine will give you an idea of... Um, how your body is properly excreting your waste materials or your waste, uh, your byproducts of the different processes inside our body. So remember that uh, remember that there are different types of urine. Um, you have your um, first morning urine. You have your random urine. You also have your suprapubic um, or yeah, your suprapubic urine and other your midstream gas. There are different types of urine in the laboratory, but for most of it, we are actually using in clinical chemistry. Ha, in clinical chemistry, for most of our measurement, we are either using your midstream catch or your random. If it is just a simple uh, measurement of your creatinine or your microalbumin. But if we are measuring, like take for example, electrolytes, um, other components of your urine, we're usually using your 24-hour urine. Again, um, in clinical chemistry, um, we usually use your uh, we usually use your um 24-hour urine. Okay, 24-hour urine. So please take note of that for our urine. So aside from urine, we also have your cerebrospinal fluid or your CSF. So your cerebrospinal fluid is also an ultrafiltrate of your plasma and will ordinarily reflect the value seen in your plasma. So if you are now on the um, CSF part in your AUBF, you will be able to notice that some of the uh, measurement of your plasma is very much is being mir mirrored in your um, CSF. Okay. So remember that when it comes to the collection of your CSF, we usually collect it on the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae between the fourth and fifth, or yeah, between the fourth and fifth or fifth and sixth lumbar vertebrae of your patient. So remember that on a usual basis, if you are able to collect your CSF properly, you can uh, get three or more samples from your patient, okay? Three or more samples from your patient. So if it is a regular, okay, if it is a regular or a normal um, collection and you are able to get three test tubes, so this will be the order of draw. So the first tube will be for clinical chemistry or serology. The second is for your microbiology. And the last one will be for your hematology, okay? Again, the last one will be for your hematology. Now, here's the thing. What if you were only able to collect one tube of cerebrospinal fluid and the, all of your sections will be sharing with that one specimen? What will be the order of draw? Remember that the order of draw for your, uh, rather the order of processing, not order of draw anymore. The order of processing, if you only have one CSF tube, the first um, section that needs to get their hand into your CSF will be your microbiology, okay? Because um, they need the specimen sterile. So the first one that will be processing the specimen will be your microbiology, followed by, okay, followed by your hematology. And last will be your, and the last one will be your, um, the last section to use your specimen will be your clinical chemistry section, okay? Your clinical chemistry section. Sir, why clinical chemistry section will be the last? Because they will just simply centrifuge that and then all cellular components, they will not be using that in the measurement. Yung only the liquid portion of your CSF. And then um, in hematology, they need the entire um, specimen, including the cellular components. In microbiology, the reason why it is the first um, section to use your CSF um, tube 
Okay? It's because they need a sterile procedure. Again, please take note that that order only happens, okay? Again, that order only happens if you only collected one tube of CSF. Kapag isa lang yung nakolect mo na CSF tube dahil na short ka or wala nang um, CSF na nilalabas yung patient, okay? If there is not enough sample and you only collected one CSF tube, then you own uh you the order of processing will be from micro hema and then clinchem sero for the last one okay that is your csf okay your csf your cerebrospinal fluid now second to the last we also have your serous fluid serous fluid can um, be in the form of your pleural fluid pericardial fluid and peritoneal fluid so remember your serous fluid is the fluid that lines um your um the inner cavity of our body to prevent um, friction and abrasion between your organs. So like take for example, right now I'm breathing, but why is it that my lungs is not having friction with my heart? It is because of your serous fluid. So there are three types of serous fluid. We have your pleural fluid. Flu pleural fluid is the one that lines your lungs. Okay, siya yung, siya, It is the liquid that is surrounding your lungs. Also, the reason why most in Filipino term, we have this thing called tubig sabaga. This is actually the one that they are pertaining to. Okay? When your pleural fluid is in excess, okay, that is what they term in Tagalog as tubig sabaga. Okay? That is your pleural fluid. Your, pe your pericardial fluid is the fluid that lines or surrounds your heart, preventing the friction of your heart from other body organs inside our body. Okay, so that is your pericardial fluid. And finally, the one that lines your gastrointestinal tract and other organs, okay, in that particular cavity are your peritoneal fluid. Okay, those are now your peritoneal fluid. So remember, you have your pleural fluid, the one that lines your lung, your pericardial, the one that lines your heart, and your peritoneal fluid, the one that lines your gastrointestinal tract, your lung, your liver, your spleen, and all the other organs in your um, gastrointestinal cavity, okay? So this one is your peritoneal. The one that covers your heart is your pericardial. The one that covers or lines your lungs, these are your peri pe your pleural fluid. Sir, what do, we, what do you mean by thoracentesis, pericardiocentesis, and paracentesis? This is the process of the, this is the collection process of your pleural fluid. So the, the pleural fluid is collected through thoracentesis. Your pericardial fluid is collected to through pericardiosynthesis and your peritoneal fluid is collected by your doctors and your medical uh, medical technologists through paracentesis. Okay? Through paracentesis. So again, thoracentesis, pericardiosynthesis, and paracentesis. So you need to take note of those three. How uh, are this flu serous fluid collected and in which particular cavity can we find this particular serous fluid? Okay, so in excess, okay, in excess, this will be detrimental and these are associated with different diseases in the body, which will be discussed further in your AUBF. Now, finally, we also have your amniotic fluid. Your amniotic fluid, on the other hand, this is the fluid or the liquid that lines, okay, that lines your... Um, your um that is within your amniotic sac okay that is within your amniotic sac so as you can see you have the fetus within your amniotic sac and the liquid that they have within that is your amniotic fluid so what is the use of your amniotic fluid so your amniotic fluid um is a product of a fetal metabolism and the constituents that are present in the fluid provide information about first the metabolic processes that took place uh within your fetus and also um, aside from your metabolic, uh, aside from metabolic byproducts, you can also determine, okay, you can also determine the fetal maturation of your fetus through the help of your amniotic fluid. And finally, then you know that aside, aside from that, your amniotic fluid can also serve as an early specimen for, um, for molecular testing for your infant or for your fetus. So if you wanted to know the chromosomal analysis of your 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 fetus you may do so by using your by using your um uh, by using your 
uh, amniotic fluid. Okay, by using your amniotic fluid. Now, finally, okay, those are the different specimens that is being used in the clinical chemistry section. So you have your blood, your urine, your CSF, your paracentesis fluid, or in general, your serous fluid. Okay, your serous fluid. And finally, we also have your amniotic fluid. Okay, your amniotic fluid. So hopefully everything was clear and you're able to understand all the things that I've been saying all this time regarding the different types of samples in the clinical chemistry section. Now, let's move forward to the next part of our discussion, which will now talk about the different collection method in the laboratory. Although some of these will be uh, will just be a review, I will be going through this particular uh, discussion quickly. Okay, number one, because um, some of these were already discussed um, in your hematology, specifically your capillary puncture. And then in our laboratory part, we're already finished discussing about your venipuncture. So I'll be showing to you some of the slide. And I think I will be able to, um, you'll be able naman then, you'll be able to take a screenshot of the procedure. I, uh, and then I'll give you some tips on how you should study this particular part. Okay, when it comes to method of collection, there are actually four types. Okay, four systems or four collection methods that are being used. We have your arterial puncture. We have your, your skin puncture, also known as your capillary puncture, also known as your heel puncture. You also have your central venous access device, okay, or your CVAD um, method of collection. And you also have your venipuncture. When it comes to your venipuncture, we have your syringe system, your ETS, your evacuated tube system, and we also have your wing infusion set or your butterfly uh, method. Okay, so let's go first with your arterial puncture. So first with your arterial puncture, remember that syringe are being used instead of evacuated tube. So uh, why, we, why are we using syringe? Because there is already a pressure exerted by your artery. So your when we do your arterial puncture, we do not pull the plunger. It will just move on its own. Why? Because of the pressure in your artery okay the pressure in your artery will be enough to move the plunger and then fill now your barrel again we do not use your your evacuated tube why because they already contain your negative vacuum they already contain your your negative pressure a vacuum that will suck the blood and we do not need that we do not want that for arterial puncture why because there's already a pressure that will be exerted by your artery. So the common, okay, the common um, arterial site puncture inside our in our body are your radial artery, your brachial artery and your femoral artery. Radial artery, look for your thumb, this is your thumb, okay? You just go um on your wrist. So this part, this one is your radial artery. So if you can um feel the pulsation, okay? If you can feel your pulse um through your radial artery, that is your radial artery people. Okay, next is your brachial artery. Your brachial artery is the artery nearest to your basilic vein. Okay, the reason why we do not usually use your basilic vein is because we might tend to, we might accidentally hit your brachial artery. And of course, we have your femoral artery. That I cannot show because, of course, that is already the femoral artery, but I can give you your picture. So you have your um, radial artery in your wrist, your brachial artery found in your antecubital fossa, and of course, your femoral, femoral artery that are found in your groin. So remember that your arterial puncture are usually used for your arterial blood gas analysis or in general for blood, um, blood gas analysis. Um, your blood gas analysis made through, the, through two specimens, your arterial blood or your capillary blood. Remember, in the order of draw for your microcollection tube, the first tube to be collected is for your capillary blood gas, okay, capillary blood gas. But if you're going to choose between the two, which one will be the most um, ideal or the most accurate specimen to be used in the laboratory? It will be your arterial blood, okay? It will be your arterial blood. So remember, when it comes to your arterial puncture, remember this, people, we do not use your tourniquet. Again, we do not use your tourniquet when it comes to arterial puncture. Why? Because, okay, so I guess I was able to put this on your quiz, on your pre-test, that we do not use your, your tourniquet um, in collecting your arterial blood or in doing your arterial puncture because it already had, it already have its own pressure. 
Okay? So, remember this, um, ladies and gentlemen, that before you perform, okay, that before you perform your arterial puncture, you need to do your modified Allen test first. Okay? Your modified Allen test needs to be performed first. So, for your modified Allen test, you can actually read through, you can actually read that um, on your um, Henry's. So, please take note to read and review the process of uh, the process of uh, modified Allen test. But in general, I'll just give you an idea what is modified Allen test. No, your modified Allen test is being performed in the laboratory so that okay, your modified Allen test is being performed in the laboratory so that we can determine if the artery can be punctured. Okay, why? Because if we puncture your radial artery, it will no longer be able to supply. Um, oxygen, oxygenated blood into your hands. That's why you need to verify if your ulnar artery, ulnar artery from your pinky going down, this one is your ulnar artery. Ulnar artery, thumb is your radial artery. So if you're going to puncture your radial artery, you need to make sure that the ulnar artery will be sufficient enough to supply blood into your hands. Why? Because if not, that will be a big problem for you and your patient. Okay, so you, we need to check the perfusion of your hand. Okay, and how do we check the perfusion of your hand? When we say perfusion, if your um if your if your blood vessel are properly distributing blood through your um through your hand, this is not just into your, in your hand, but um perfusion is in ge is a general term. If um your blood vessel can uh, deliver the blood through your organs or other parts of your body. So again, um, to check the perfusion, to check the perfusion, you need to perform your modified Allen test. Again, that is your modified Allen test. In Tagalog, your modified Allen test, ginagawa natin to para makita, ma-check kung sapat ba yung, isang ar yung artery na iiwan mo para patuloy na dumalo yung dugo dun sa kamay mo. Kasi kung hindi, you, you cannot perform. Okay? If your modified Allen test is negative, if your modified Allen test is negative, you cannot perform your arterial puncture. Okay? You cannot perform your arterial puncture. Now, moving forward, before I proceed to your, art, to your skin puncture quickly, please do remember that when it comes to your arterial puncture, we use different angle. Okay? We use different angle. Remember that when it comes to your veni puncture, the ideal ang, um, angle will be 15 to 30 degrees. Okay, 15 to 30 degrees for veni puncture, but for arterial puncture, it can range from 30 degrees to 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, not 90 degrees Celsius, 90 degree angle. Okay, so 30 to 90 degree angle, depending on the side. Okay, depending on the side. If you are Okay, if you are collecting through your radial artery, the angle should be 30 to 45 degrees. 30 to 45 degrees. Although for most uh for most of the time we use the 45 degree uh angle for your radial artery. For your brachial, okay, for your brachial and your femoral, we use as your 90 degree angle. So perpendicular. So take for example, this is your this is your I know this is your arm, you just simply puncture that this way. Okay, I guess you can see my, ano, so yeah. So, 30, 90 degree angle for femoral and brachial, 45 degree angle for your radial artery. Okay, so that's all the things that I want you guys to remember when it comes to arterial puncture. Number one, in arterial puncture, we collect your arterial blood. We do not use your evacuated tube. Um, these are the particular um, site of collection that we can utilize for arterial puncture. We do not use your tourniquet. We need to perform modified Allen tests before performing your arterial puncture. And finally, your arterial puncture is used for your arterial blood gas analysis, which is important in clinical chemistry, specifically when you are determining acid-base balance disorders. Okay? Acid-base balance disorders. Now, finally, aside from arterial puncture, we also have your skin puncture, also known as your heel puncture, also known as your capillary puncture in the laboratory. Okay, so apologies if you cannot see the, I uh, know, so I'll stop my sharing quickly, okay, just so that uh, you guys can see, okay. So remember um, that when it comes to your arterial, when it comes to your skin puncture, okay, when it comes to your skin puncture, 
um, it's very important for us to remember um, to wipe the first drop of blood with a clean, dry cloth. Again, um, I'm not going to discuss na further the the procedure when it comes to your skin puncture. Please do review again, ha. Um, I will not be discussing it thoroughly because it's already done in hematology lab and even in the eventually in the lecture. So please review that. So you need to wipe the first drop of blood with a dry clean uh, uh, dry cotton or gauze. So always remember to cut or to puncture the site perpendicular or across the fingerprint, 90 degree angle or perpendicular dapat. Do not melt the site because um, it will cause hemolysis and excess um, tissue fluid. Remember that the lancet, the needle of your lancet um, is measured 1.75 millimeter and the depth of incision for your infant should be less than 2.0 millimeter and for your adults, okay, 2 to 3 millimeter um, na, punct na depth incision. So please do remember the common, um, common site of um, collection for your skin puncture. Um, for adult and for um, older children, you can use the third or fourth finger. Okay, of the non of their non-dominant hand. Um, you can also use your earlobe. You can also, of course, use your heel for your infants, most specifically the lateral side of the plant, uh, the lateral side of the plantar surface of the heel. Okay, the lateral side of the plantar surface of the heel, which is this one. So remember, I always um reiterate this that it is best used to use the, the lateral side of your um of the of the infant's heel because um, in the medial or in the median part, you have your um, posterior tibial artery that might fall, uh, that might be accidentally punctured during your, um, during your um, capillary puncture, okay? So remember, when it comes to your fingerprint, you need to puncture across or perpendicular to your, uh, perpendicular to your, uh, what do you call this? It should be perpendicular to your, fingerprints okay it should be perpendicular to your fingerprint of course please do remember the things that are also important in your skin puncture like um, the use of povidone iodine because it can increase your your bilirubin your uric acid your potassium and your phosphorus aside from that you need to use your warming device warming device that should be less than 40 degrees celsius this time celsius na talaga it should be less than the, uh, less than 40 degrees celsius um, to warm the site so that it can in, you can increase the blood flow in that particular area uh, where you will be collecting your blood. Now, in addition to that, we also have, of course, your um, central venous access device, your CVAD, okay, um, provide a ready access to patient circulation, eliminating uh, multiple phlebotomy. So these are usually for patients um, uh, that are actually chemo- patient that uh, where or dialysis patient in which their veins are being preserved for therapy or for dialysis. So instead of being used for phleb phlebotomy purposes, we can simply use your CVAD so that we will avoid multiple um, phlebotomy to our patient or multiple um, collection or extraction from our patient. So um, how can we do that? So we can use your central venous access device. So it will eliminate multiple phlebotomy and most especially useful for critical care and even in surgical situation. So the sites usually are your cephalic vein, okay, your cephalic vein in your antecubital fossa or your internal jugular um, vein dito sa leg, your subclavian. If you have watched um, Nightbird, okay, meron siyang subclavian na CVAD, okay, um, right across her chest, okay, and you also have, of course, you can also have your CVAD on the femoral area, okay, on the femoral area, but um, on the femoral area, and in addition to that, your central venous device, okay, your central venous device, um, needs to be uh, when you are collecting your blood through your central venous access devices, um, it's important for you to take note of your discard tube. Okay. Uh, your discard tube hopefully is familiar to you because this uh, we also use your discard tube if we are collecting blood from a patient with IV fluid inserted to them. Okay. Take for example, both hand has IV fluid. Um, inserted. So meaning to say, you can um, ideally, you cannot use their veins in there 
to in to collect um to collect your blood but of course there's no other um other site for you to collect your blood so you need to um collect your collect your blood through the arm with your um CVAD or your intravenous um intravenous fluid or there is an intravenous insertion so what you need to do is to um have your discard tube your discard tube uh, usually we collect a minimum of 2 ml and a maximum of 5 ml 2 to 5 ml of blood we collect that first take for example you're going to collect um for um coagulation and then chemistry um and you are collecting through a um central venous access device so the first thing that you need to do is to collect blood through a discard tube discard tube because obviously you will be discarding this blood because it is contaminated by um intravenous fluid or it is contaminated um because it will be passing through the line pa of your CVAD. So the first thing that you need to do is to, to collect sufficient blood, 2 to 5 ml, um, to, to be drawn in a clear and uh, in the in a clear test tube or a yeah, clear test tube, a plain test tube, or a simple red test tube. Okay, just to clear out the line, okay, to avoid any contamination from your patient. Again, ha, we need to um collect a discard um discard we need to collect blood for your discard tube 2 to 5 ml and then after collecting the discard tube okay after collecting the discard tube that's the time now that you can collect your samples so if it is your light blue your yellow if a uh, red top heparin your lavender so you can collect them na after collecting your discard tube okay Again, your discard tube will not be used for any test in the lab because it is contaminated. Okay, it is contaminated. Um, it is. It will really just be discarded. But take note, you don't need to inform your patient na. Okay, again, you don't need to inform your patient na, Mom, ha, itatapon ko din to, teran. No. Okay, we're not going to mention that to your patient. Okay? So that is your central venous access device. Again, this is usually um, done and use, useful for critical care patient surgical situation, including those who will undergo dialysis and chemotherapy. Okay? So, moving forward, um, ito lang, um, a, quick, um, a quick reminder on the order of draw in your catheter lines. This is found or taken from your Henry's. So, again, you need to draw uh, in some textbook in Macaul, take for example, 2 to 5, but in Henry's, 3 to 5 siya. Okay, 3 to 5. So 3 to 5 ml in a syringe or a discard tube. And then you can now collect your um your tube for blood culture, your anticoag anticoagulated tube, and then for your clotting, uh for your clot tubes, your red top, and then other serum tubes. Okay, other serum tubes. But again, one thing that I want always you guys to remember is to first collect your discard tube. Okay, your discard tube. So if if, we, if you guys could see now, like, um, there are um, there are procedures that needs to be performed before arterial puncture that is modified Allen test for skin puncture warming the the site for CVAD naman collecting a discard tube first. Okay. Now finally, this one is very much common to you. This is your vein puncture. So when we say vein puncture, this is the um, blood collected from a patient's vein, which is also what we term as phlebotomy. So what we collect here are the oxygenated blood because it is the one that passes through your uh, that passes through your vein, uh, and the common uh, com the commonly used vein for vein puncture are located in your antecubital fossa. So of course, um, you guys are very much familiar. So the best vein for vein puncture is your median cubital vein. Second choice is your cephalic vein, and the third one, the the least cho the least preferred um, vein is your basilic vein. Okay, so again, uh, this is the order: your median cubital, your cephalic vein, and your basilic vein. If we're asked what is the most preferred vein, you answer your median cubital vein. But if you are asked, guys, what is the most preferred site, the answer to that is your ante ante or ante cubital fossa. But of course, there are patients um, that were already underwent mastectomy. Um, there are other complications, like take for example hematoma, rash, or other bruising on that on the antecubital fossa. What would be your 
alternative site. Of course, you can use um, when the antecubital fossa or the antecubital veins are not accessible, you can actually um, collect your blood through your dorsal venous arc or your metacarpal plexus. Your metacarpal, this one on your on your wrist, or you can collect through your dorsal uh, your dorsal venous arc. Okay, on your um, what do you call this pa? Um, on your hand, okay? So you will be collecting through your, ayan. You will be collecting through your hand. So have you experienced coll collecting blood um, other than the antecubital fossa? Yes. I've collected blood, when I've already collected blood through your hands and even through your feet, okay? There was a time that our patient um, doesn't have um, any accessible um, vein on their antecubital fossa, I cannot shut down naman the IV fluid because um, the patient's, the patient's um, situation at the time is, was critical. So they need to have the IV fluid running. So our only choice left was their foot. Okay, So I collected uh, blood through the foot of your patient. But remember, if you're going to do that in the future, the one thing that you need to remember Okay, before collecting is that you need to confirm if your patient are diabetic or not. If your patient are diabetic, your foot, the feet of your patient are a no-no. You cannot collect blood or you can, yeah, you cannot collect blood through your feet um, if your patient are diabetic. But if they are normal naman, then you can do so. Okay, you may do so. Again, sir, bakit hindi po po pwede pag diabetic? Because remember, they're, um, they're, uh, what do you call this? Their wounds don't heal normal as normal as um, us na walang diabetes. Okay? Na walang diabetes. Okay? So, please do remember that. Okay? Please do remember that. So, for the procedure, um, here is your um, procedure. I'll be giving you um, five seconds for each slide. So, five, four, three, two, one, zero. So remember the things that you need to review here. Of course, the procedure, the purpose of the procedure, which is actually on your laboratory manual, laboratory exercise number two. Okay? And then, yeah. Next slide. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay? Let's move forward. Di ba? Parang nag online shopping. Nahawaan na tayo ni Sir Mark. So, last slide. Okay? Please take a photo. Okay? Ma'am, Sir, pa take a photo. Pa, take na po ako ng screenshot. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. So please review the procedure of your venipuncture, um, the distance, how to do your cleansing, of course, your antiseptic technique. I already have discussed in the previous discussion, in the pre um, analyt in the patient preparation, the alternatives and the different and the different antiseptics that you need we need to use. Okay, now moving forward, of course, um, I hope all of you are still okay there. Um, this one will be quite long um discussion, but again, these are actually just a review na. Okay, um, these are actually just a review of your phlebotomy. So, of course, we're going to now discuss the different devices for blood collection. So, of course, you have here your tourniquet, your blood collection system, either syringe, evacuated, and your wing infusion set, your lancets, and your micro collection tubes together with your evacuated tubes. Okay, so for your tourniquet, remember that your tourniquet is made up of a pliable rubber, usually latex, or a strip of Velcro. So, ayan, this is surely, um, usually you, we are using your latex, but this one, this is a type of a Velcro na sample, a Velcro tourniquet. So, remember that we use your tourniquet um, to aid us, to help us locate your patient's vein. So, much of my discussion about tourniquet was already discussed in the pre uh, analytical patient patient preparation. But again, let me reiterate to everybody that you need to apply uh, you need to apply your tourniquet at your patient's arm during venipuncture. And once blood flow was established, you can already remove your tourniquet. So that's one thing, no? Uh, if you're reading your books and even in most of the webinars, seminars, and conferences we've been na, um, once your, your blood flow is established, you can already release your tourniquet. 
Again, once your blood flow was established, kapag meron nang pumasok na dugo sa hub, you can already um, release your tourniquet. So aside from that, um, remember that it should not be left um, um, on your patient's arm longer than one minute. And if you're going to reapply your, your tourniquet, you need to wait for two minutes before reapplication. Please do remember the distance of your tourniquet application from the site. It should be three to four inches away from the phlebotomy site or 10 centimeter if we're going up, if we're talking about your metric system. Aside from that, in case that you don't have your tourniquet or you have patient, obese patient that um uh, obese patient and we cannot use the tourniquet to them kasi nga nagro-roll or hindi kasha, okay? Hindi kasha yung tourniquet. We can actually use your blood pressure cuff. Just remember that when you're using your blood pressure cuff, the blood the pressure that you need to exert should be below the diastolic pressure of your patient or in general it should be less than 40 mm mercury, okay? Again, an alternative for your tourniquet, if you don't have your latex or your Velcro tourniquet, you can use your blood pressure cuff. But remember to have to apply the pressure lower than your diastolic um, diastolic pressure. Or just to give you an idea now, it should be less, it should be um less than or equal to 40 millimeter mercury. Okay, less than or equal to 40 millimeter mercury if you're using your blood pressure cuff. Again, what's the what are the instances that you are using your blood pressure cuff? Number one, if there is no um, available tourniquet in the laboratory. And secondly, if your patients are obese and the tourniquet does not fit them. Okay? And the tourniquet does not fit them. Now, aside from your tourniquet, of course, we also have different blood collection system that are being used in the laboratory. The first one are your syringe. So your syringe, um, the usual syringe that we are using, the most common gauge of your syringe is 21 gauge, okay? For your um, normal patient, for your, your patient that has normal veins, we are using your 21 gauge. So remember, uh, by the way, that your, your gauge and your bore are inversely proportional or indirectly proportional. The higher the gauge, okay? The higher the gauge, the smaller the bore. The, high, the lower the gauge, the larger the bore. Okay, the larger the bore. Or the, when you say bore, yung butas. Okay, the, the bore or the hole in your needle. Okay, the usual length of this, the usual length of the, the needle is 1 to 1.5 inches in length. Okay, the needle is 1 to 1.5 inches. And then of course, please do remember that your 21 gauge is most common for your, uh, is the most common gauge for your syringe. Okay, for your blood collection, if we are collecting from fragile vein, fragile geriatric, elderly, uh, or pediatric, the infants or the chill uh, or the kids, we are using your twenty three gauge. Okay, so if your vein are fragile, if you have um patients, um uh, if you have elderly or children, na patient, we need to use your. 23 gauge. You also use your 25 gauge if you are collecting blood through the scalp. Okay, scalp. Yeah, scalp. Okay, if you're using, if you're collecting through your scalp, you use your 25 gauge. So again, please remember the different parts of your syringe. We have your bevel. It should always be bevel up. Your The shaft of your needle, that is, uh, the needle is 1 to 1.5 inches in length. You have your hub. And then you have your graduated barrel, you have your plunger, and this is completely assembled syringe system. Um, in addition to your syringe system, if you're using your syringe system, of course, we need to transfer the blood um, that we collected. So usually we use your uh, syringe transfer. Yeah, we use your syringe transfer device. So in your syringe transfer device, uh, we transfer your blood, okay, so that uh, we could prevent the hemolysis of your blood. Of course, aside from your ETS, we also have your evacuated tube system. Your ETS, which is the most common and the most efficient system, and it's the preferred um, collection tube, a uh, collection system by the CLSI for um, collection collecting your blood. So it is a closed system preventing exposure um, to air contaminants um, and to air and other contaminants in the environment. Okay, again, this is the most common and these are the different parts 
are the different components of your evacuated tube system. So you have your multi-sample needle. So it is a two-way needle. Okay, you have your tube holder or your adapter. And of course, you have your evacuated tube. Evacuated tube that has different colors and those different colors signifies different uses or different additives within them. Okay, so those are your evacuated tube system. So please take note of them. So again, these are the components, your multi-sample needle, okay, that will allow you to collect multiple tube of um, multiple tubes of blood, unlike your, your syringe that is a single venipuncture. So if you use your syringe 5 ml, you will only be collecting at most 7 ml. But if you use your ETS, like take for example, last time I collected blood from a patient, I collected 12 uh, test tubes from a patient. Okay? So that's very important for you to remember. Okay? So for the evacuated tube, remember that there's a vacuum present already or a negative pressure. That's why upon inserting your evacuated tube, the blood will already be um, flushing into the tube okay, or will be collected into your tube. Okay, So that is it for your ETS. So aside from that, we also have your wing infusion set or your butterfly. So it is an indispensable tool for collecting blood for small difficult veins such as hand vein. If you're using your dorsal plexus, um, veins of your elderly patients, pediatric patients, and most specifically also helpful if your patients are um, cancer patients because they're, they, we will really have a hard time or a difficult time collecting blood from them. Okay? So aside from that, of course, um, please do remember that the, the needle of your wing infusion set or your butterfly is usually one half or three fourth inch, okay, and it's connected to a five to twelve inches long tubing. So this one, um, you have your your needle, okay, your needle around one half to three fourths inch, and then you have a five to twelve inches long na tubing, okay, five to um twelve inches long na tubing. And here you can insert either your, uh, you can insert here your syringe or sometimes you can simply insert here your adapter and then you can collect through your evacuated tube system. Okay, again, remember that when you're using your butterfly or your wing infusion set, you need to have a discard tube. Why? Because um, the first few drops of blood or the first few ml of blood are contaminated with air because um, it needs to fill in the tubings first. Okay? So aside from that, other devices for your uh, blood collection, specifically for your skin puncture, um, and for your skin puncture are your lancets. So of course, you already know this. You have your, your capillary tubes. Your red capillary tubes contains your heparin. Okay? Your, your, uh, your heparin, your blue, uh, your blue hematocrit tubes does not have your anticoagulant, okay? Wala siya anticoagulant. Of course, ayan, these are your um, uh, microhematocrit tubes. Remember that they hold around 50 to 70 microliter of blood. So this is your hematocrit tube, which will be discussed further in hematology. So we're just discussing and reviewing it briefly here in ClinChem. And finally, you also have here your um, bullets or your micro collection tubes. Again, for the order of draw for your micro collection tube, the first tube should be collected for your capillary blood gas. Again, I want you guys to be particular when it comes to this because um, there's arterial blood gas and there's also capillary blood gas and then followed by EDTA and then other tubes with additives and then your non-additive tube will be the last one. Okay? So that is for your micro collection tube. But now, what about your um what about your evacuated tube of course we also have okay, we also have your uh we also have your evacuated tube system okay we also have your evacuated tube system and we also uh will be using okay we will also be using your we will also be using your uh we'll also be using your order of draw for your evacuated tube system. And for everybody, no, I want you na, na by this time, I want everybody to review and memorize this table. Okay? So the different color stopper, color 
uh, the different stopper colors, the different anticoagulants and additives that they contain, the different types of specimen and their use, and of course, the mechanism of action. When you say mechanism of action, the action of the anticoagulant or the additive found on your tube. Okay? So for the order of draw, okay, for the order of draw, okay, again, I'll give you five seconds, five, four, three, two, one to screenshot this. You can also find this at table three dash four of your Henry's. So please, again, this is one table that you need to memorize, that you really need to take into heart from this day on, okay, from this day on. So please take note of that. And finally, this is the order of draw for your, uh, this is the order of draw for your um for your um samples or for your your evacuated tube um for your evacuated tube so the first one is of course your yellow again when it comes to order of draw we per, we refer to them by color rather than by additive why because yun nga uh, when we say color we go by the color of the st stopper or the colored top tube okay so your yellow, your light blue, followed by your serum tubes. Your serum tubes can be your uh, gold top tube or your your um, speckled red or your tiger red. Your red top, your either red plastic or red glass, and you also have your orange top tube. And then you have your light blue, okay? Your uh, light blue, tuloy. Your light green, and then your green top tube that contains your heparin. Your lavender or your purple that contains your EDTA. Your white that contains your K2 EDTA with gel separator. And of course, your gray top tube that contains your fluoride. And then um, just for the information of everybody, you know, the black top tube should be collected after your gray top. Okay? Your black top tube is to be collected after your gray top. So um, this is the order of draw. And then the other, um, other, um, other, other test tubes will be collected after your gray top line. Again, after your gray top. Um, example of that, you know, take for example, um, your black. So after sila, nang, they, we are being, we, they are being used after your gray top. Again, please remember the, the inversion. So again, like what I mentioned, the magic number is eight. Except for your uh, gold top, you need to mix them for five, five times. Your red plastic five times and then your light blue top okay that contains your sodium citrate you need to mix them for three to four times so again um why is there an order of draw in the laboratory why do we need to perform and why do we need to follow the order of draw simple ladies and gentlemen because your order of draw okay because your order of draw now refers to the order in which tubes are to be collected during your multiple tube draw or are filled from a syringe. So your CLSI recommend the order of draw following this order. Okay. So you use your step, you uh, perform your ET, your sterile tube first, and then your blue top, and then your serum tube, and then your heparin tubes, and then your EDTA tube, and then your glycolytic inhibitor tubes. Again, please refer to them according to color. And now the ultimate purpose of this is to prevent first the carryover or cross-contamination of anticoagulants, and at the same time, to um, cross-contaminants um, of blood then from one test tube from the other. Aside from that, is this also to prevent tissue thromboplastin contamination and also to prevent microbial contamination, okay? To prevent microbial contamination in our patients, okay? So please remember, this is the purpose, the sole purpose of your order of draw. Hindi to dahil trip ko lang, parang mas mag, uh, parang it's, it is of better color scheme or whatsoever, no? It is because we are preventing cross-contamination or carryover. Um, there is uh, what we call your anticoagulant reflux. Okay, what do we mean by anticoagulant reflux? Sometimes the anticoagulant within your tube enters your blood vessel. So we also need to prevent that from happening because if that happens, you will be contaminating the succeeding tubes that you will be collecting. Okay? That you will be collecting. So that is the order of draw. Again, please remember, it's very important for you guys to take note and to, I really uh, want you not to memorize this because this will get you very, very far. Okay? So if there's one thing that I want you guys to take from Clinchem, 
Okay, aside of course from the um from all the other topics that we discuss. Um when asked of the different anticoagulants, you know na what are those. So I also want you guys to remember which one uh will give you your plasma and which one will yield you your serum. Because a lot of you are still confused with that. Okay? So remember, if your test tube contains anticoagulant, you will get your whole blood. And if you centrifuge that, you'll get your plasma. If it does not have your anticoagulant, then if you centrifuge that, you'll get your serum. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I want you guys to remember that inside your test tube, it's not always anticoagulant. Okay? Tagalogin ko ha, para sa mga Filipino students natin. Ang test tubes mo, hindi pala aging anticoagulant ang laman. That's why we call them additives because there are different additives within your test tube. Okay? It can be your your tixotropic gel, it can be your SPS, it can be your anticoagulant, your anti-glycolytic agent, or it can even be your clot activator. So hindi lahat ng laman ng test tube, not all um, component of your test tube are anticoagulant. Some of them are clot activators. Or some of them perform different um, purposes that are vital in our collection. So with that being said, we'll be discussing the different tubes briefly. So I'll be discussing them and highlighting some of the things that I need you guys to remember. So let's start off with your yellow SPS. I call it yellow SPS because there is another yellow top tube which will be discussed in the special tube that contains your acid citrate dextrose. So your yellow SPS contains your sodium polyanethyl sulfonate. And I want you guys to be specific because if you only answer sodium polyanethyl sulfonate, that's wrong because the correct answer is a 0.025% of your sodium polyanethyl sulfonate. Again, we are using your 0.025% sodium polyanethyl sulfonate in the laboratory. So what is the purpose of your so your 0.025 sodium polyanethyl sulfonate in the laboratory? So it aids in the bacterial recovery of um in the bacterial recovery um by inhibiting your complement, okay? It inhibits your complement, it inhibits your phagocyte and it can also inhibit certain antibiotics. So your yellow SPS are usually for your microbiological tests or your micro biological culture in the, obviously, in the bacteriology section. So please do remember that your sodium polyanethyl sulfonate is also a is also an anticoagulant. So your SPS, um, the action of your SPS in, is by inhibiting rather by chelating. Okay? They are able to inhibit your complement, your phagocyte, and other antibiotics. Okay, in the laboratory. And more specifically, it is able or capable of inhibiting your complement and at the same time, preventing coagulation by chelating your calcium. Okay? Again, um, here, ayan, your yellow, um, it inhibits your complement, it inhibits your phagocyte by um, binding to your calcium. Okay, that is your 0.025% sodium polyanethyl sulfonate. Again, yellow SPS for bacteriology and it should be sterile. Second, after your yellow SPS, we collect now your light blue top. Your light blue top can either contain your 0.105 molar or 0.129 molar of your sodium citrate. We have two... Um, Two formulation for your sodium citrate, it can be your 3.2% or 3.8% sodium citrate. Remember that your light blue top is best for coagulation tests, specifically your prothrombin time and your activated partial thromboplastin time. That is what you mean by PT, okay? Prothrombin time with international normalized ratio. That important for now, okay? But again, remember your PT and PTT is what we call collectively as your coagulation test. Okay, your coagulation test. What are coagulation tests? We are determining if your body has enough coagulation factor that will um that will aid or will help in the formation of clot or in the formation of your fibrin. Okay, so your PT is your pro thrombin time. Your APTT is your activated partial thromboplastin time. So 
Remember, when it comes to your light blue top, okay, it preserves your labile coagulation factors. It preserves your labile coagulation factors. So there are coagulation factors. These are proteins as well. So there are a list of coagulation factor, but do not worry, that will be part of your hematology too next semester. So again, when it comes to your light blue top, it contains your sodium citrate. And it is very important for you to remember the blood to anticoagulant ratio, which is 9 is to 1. Okay? 9 is to 1. Again, the correct um, the correct blood to anticoagulant ratio is 9 is to 1. Okay? 9 is to 1 blood to anticoagulant. Please take note of that. Okay? Because most of the students, when we when we switch that, if we call what is the anticoagulant to blood ratio? They would still answer 9 is to 1. But the correct answer now will be 1 is to 9. Okay? So remember that when it comes to your light blue top, this one is very sensitive when it comes to volume. So you have a triangle here. So the ideal one will be in the middle of the triangle. That is the correct volume, uh, the correct fill volume for your light blue top. The upper part of the triangle, that will be the maximum will still be accepted in the laboratory. And then the lower part of the triangle, okay, the lower point of the triangle, that is the minimum. So if you reach the minimum, we can accept the specimen. If you reach the maximum, we can reach the specimen. But if it exceeds the maximum or it was short, um, or it was short or um, uh, you had a short draw, okay, the, the collected blood was short, Okay, below the minimum, that will be rejected. Okay, underfilled, overfilled light blue top will be rejected. Again, underfilled and overfilled light blue top will be rejected. Again, because we are maintaining and we are making sure that the blood to, coag blood to anticoagulant ratio should be 9 is to 1. Okay, 9 is to 1. One. So aside from your light blue top, let's go now to your serum separate serum tubes. Okay, so when we call when we say serum tubes collectively, these are group of tubes that when centrifuge the spec when you centrifuge the specimen, you will get your serum. And generally, we can divide your serum tubes into two. We have your serum separator tubes and we have your simple serum tubes. When we say serum separator tubes, these are the one that contains your thixotropic gel. Okay. Again, these are the ones that contain your thixotropic gel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will not be accepting answers like inert gel because you need to be specific. These are thixotropic gel. Okay? So your red-gray top tube are example. These are tigered or speckled um, red top tube. Okay? Red top tube. When we say speckled, there are um, speckle of, speckled of gray or black colors on their on their uh, stopper. So these are usually being used for clinical chemistry. Okay, you will get your serum, okay, out of it. So you need to mix it for five times, okay, five inversions. So again, your red-gray top tube, it does contain your thixotropic gel. Co um, clotting time with, within 15 to 30 minutes, okay? So aside from your gray top, your, your red-gray top tube, red and gray top tube, or your tiger red tubes, of course, you have your gold top tube. Your gold top tube is the most commonly used in the laboratory. Although in the Philippine setting, you will still see a lot of red top tube. Remember that your gold top tube, um, it does contain your thixotropic gel. Okay, your thixotropic gel and it is being used for clinical chemistry section. Again, please take note of the table that I have given you in Henry's. You need to memorize and familiarize yourself with that. Now, aside from your gold top tube, okay, uh, your gold top tube and your red gray or your speckled red or tiger red tube, those are your serum separator tube. Why do we call them serum separator tube? Because they do have a barrier, a physical barrier um, that will separate your serum from the cellular component of your blood. Um, and that is through the help of your thixotropic gel, okay? That is through the help of your thixotropic gel. Please do remember that there are certain tests in the clinical chemistry section that discourages the use of your serum separator tube because some of the analytes, some of your, take for example, therapeutic drugs and some of your trace elements and heavy metal, they tend to adhere on the gel, that's why we do not use your serum separator tube. So if we cannot use your serum separator tube, 
then that's the time that we can use your serum tubes. Okay? Your serum tubes. Your red top tube, your plastic contains your silica particle. You need to invert it for five times. It is usually being used. And chemistry, immunology, and blood banking. Highlight on immunology. Um, similarly, in clinical chem, um, it's specifically in trace element, therapeutic drug, heavy metals, we do not use your serum separator tube because of the gel. In immunology, we do we also discourage the use of your gold top or any tube that contains your gel. Why? Because your antibodies, okay, your antibodies tend also to adhere to your gel. So if your antibody adhere to your gel, you will not be able to, to measure them in the laboratory that will lead to a falsely reactive, a falsely non-reactive or false negative result. As for your serum tube, your red top tube, again, it contains your silica particle. Um, aside from your silica particle, it can also have your glass particle or your qualine or your cellite. So those are the other components of your plastic. Um, you need to invert them for five times. So the reason why we con we re we converted to your plastic tubes because glass tubes are somehow hazards in the laboratory. But again, there are times that we cannot go away, uh, go away apart from your your um red your your glass test tubes again because um glass test tubes are non porous okay meaning to say um they can preserve the anticoagulant within them unlike in your plastic tubes okay so aside from your red top tubes red your red plastic we also have your red glass it does have it doesn't have any additive so it does not have any um gel no and your no clot activator so it doesn't need any inversion again when you centrifuge your sample your blood that are collected through your red top glass you'll be having your serum okay so the usual coagulation time or clotting time rather for your red top tubes your red glass okay is 30 minutes to 60 minutes or one hour Okay, so aside from your your red top, your red glass, you also have your orange top tubes. Your orange top tube contains your thrombin. Okay, it contains your thrombin. Um, it uh, the clotting time is usually five minutes, and it is being used for clinical chemistry and other stat sample. So before, um, as you heard me mention kanina, um, in stat samples for clinical chem, we usually use your um your plasma, like specifically the one that are collected in your green top tube. But now we can use your, um, your orange top tube because it contains your thrombin. Your thrombin will, uh, will readily com convert your fibrinogen to fibrin. It will clot within five minutes only. Okay, but of course, there are certain limitations when it comes to your orange top tube, specifically if your patient has um, thrombocytosis or increased um, increased platelets. It is still best to you. It is best you to use your green top tube in case of stat electrolytes. Okay, specifically for your electrolytes. So aside from orange top tube, of course we have your light green. Your light green contains either your lithium heparin or your sodium heparin. But this one, light green, denotes the presence of your gel. So these are plasma separator tubes. Bakit plasma separator tube? Because it does not sim it doesn't simply separate your plasma from the packed red cell, but it uses a physical barrier in the form of your thixotropic gel. So your light green contains your sodium or your lithium heparin together with a gel separator. In this case, your thixotropic gel as well. So this is also being used for chemistry section. And for your plasma. Uh, for your plasma tube, let's start off with your green top tubes. Okay, your green top, it only contains your lithium or your sodium heparin without, that is without gel. Okay, so please correct that without gel. Okay, without gel. Also used for um, chemistry. Now, aside from your, um, your, your, aside from that, remember that your uh, lithium heparin and your sodium heparin are your anticoagulant anticoagulant in your in your uh, light green and your green top tube and their action is to inhibit your thrombin they inhibit your thrombin so please remember that because for most of your 
anticoagulant, most of their action is by preventing your or by reacting or acting um, by binding to your calcium. Your green top is the only one that uh, your green top okay, is the only one that contains your heparin and it is the only one that inhibits your thrombin. Now, aside from that, of course, we have your plasma tubes, uh, your lavender top or your purple top that contains your ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid or your EDTA. There are two um, formulation of your EDTA, your dipotassium and your tripotassium EDTA. And it is being used in hematological, uh, most hematological processes or procedures. But in clinical chem, we are using it in measuring your hema your glycated hemoglobin or your HbA1c. And a thing that I need you guys to remember when it comes to your lavender top is that the most common formulation that is being used in the laboratory is your K2 or your dipotassium EDTA. In our quizzes, abbreviation will not be accepted. So please remember, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid without spaces in between, okay, um, except for acid. So aside from your lavender, again, the last tube to be collected will be now your gray top tube, okay, that would contain two components. Okay, there are two additives that are found in your gray top tube, your sodium fluoride and your potassium oxalate. Your sodium fluoride is an anticoagulant. It, I, rather, your sodium fluoride is your anti-glycolytic agent that prevents, the, um, that prevents your glycolysis. And then you also have your potassium oxalate, which is your anticoagulant. So in clinical chemistry, we can use your gray top tube in the collection of sample for glucose, lactate, and also alcohol or your ethanol. So remember that when it comes to your um, sodium fluoride, it inhibits your it um, it inhibits or it binds directly to your magnesium. Okay, it binds to your magnesium, inhibiting your enzymes. Okay, that will um, inhibiting your enzymes that are essential in your glycolysis. So we prevent the degradation of your um, your glucose by your red blood cells, okay, by your red blood cell. So, kunwari, uh, you'll be traveling the blood, you don't have your centrifuge yet, so your great top tube is a best um, alternative to that if you don't have your uh, gel separator, okay? So, because it will be preventing your glycolysis. Other special tubes, okay, so those are the routine tubes that you can see in the laboratory, okay? So, you have your yellow, okay, your yellow SPS, your light blue, your serum tube, your plasma tube, your green, your purple, and then also your gray top. There are also other special tubes that I want to discuss briefly. So the first special tube is your pink top tube. Your pink top tube, is it actually contains your K2 EDTA. Your K2 EDTA is a spray-dried EDTA, okay? Spray-dried EDTA, and it is usually used for blood banking and molecular diagnostic. Pink top tube, ah? pink top tube. So, sir, um, it does contain K2 EDTA. So, what is the difference between my pink top and my lavender? Your pink top tube contains a special labeling. Okay, a special labeling allotted for your blood bank. Okay? It has a special labeling, uh, a special label that is allotted for your blood bank. So, that is for your pink top. Again, for blood banking and molecular diagnostic, it contains your spray-dried K2 EDTA. I guess I was not able to mention, no, your K2 EDTA can be of two form. Your K2 EDTA is um, spray-dried. Your K3 EDTA is in liquid form. Okay? In liquid form. So, aside from that, um, I was able to mention this na kanina. We have your white top tube. Your white top tube contains your EDTA and your gel usually for molecular testing. White blood, uh, white top tube for molecular diagnostic. And next, we also have your royal blue top. Your royal blue top can be of two form. Actually, um, it can contain K2 EDTA or sodium heparin. And in some royal, top, royal blue uh, colored top, they also contain silica particles. So when you're using your royal blue, you can actually collect serum if, if it contains your silica particle, if it contains your K2 EDTA or sodium, sodium heparin, it, you will be able to collect your plasma. Okay? So these are usually for toxic, toxicology, for your trace element and your heavy metals. So please do remember that your royal blue top um, 
even though um there are some some there are um other tube that already contain your K2, EDTA and your sodium heparin, your royal blue denote that it is for toxicology. Now finally, last three tubes we have now your um yellow top tube. This one contains your acid citrate dextrose. Okay, your acid citrate dextrose is for your uh, your yellow top tube is for your blood banking, but most specifically, this is for your HLA phenotyping or paternity testing. So DNA testing, HLA phenotyping, these are um these are also molecular techniques, but not PCR. Okay, HLA phenotyping and paternity testing. What are we going to use? Your yellow top tube, but not the yellow top tube that contains 0.025% sodium polyanethyl sulfonate, but the one that contains your ice acid, citrate, dextrose, or known as your ACD. Okay, that is your yellow top tube. Um, I will not be discussing your acid citrate dextrose as an anticoagulant for blood bank muna because that is different. Okay, here the purpose of your um. Again, I want to be clear. The purpose of your acid citrate dextrose in a test tube is to preserve your WBC. Okay, More importantly, to preserve your WBC that will be used for HLA phenotyping and paternity testing. I need to specify ACD in the test tube because there is an ACD, your acid citrate dextrose, that can be found in your blood bags. Okay, And they have a different purpose. Okay? So that is for your yellow top tube. Now we also have your what? We also have your tan top tubes. Okay, your tan top tubes, okay? If it is a glass tan top tube, it the anticoagulant or the additive is heparin. If it is a plastic tan top tube, it contains your K2 EDTA. K2 EDTA is again a spray dried type of EDTA. So your tan top tubes are usually um, used for lead testing or lead determination. So unlike your royal blue, diba? your royal blue, that is for your trace element, which actually lead belongs to, but we are not using the royal blue for lead. Instead, we're using your tan top tube. That is to denote that this particular sample collected in your tan top tube is exclusively for lead testing. Okay? for lead testing. Now, finally, last tube for today, okay, is your block top tube. Your block top tube contains your buffered citrate dextrose. Ah, buffered citrate dextrose. That is not, uh, that is already a, uh, in another world. Okay, your block top tubes contain your buffered sodium citrate, rather. So your buffered sodium citrate um, is used for Westergren ESR. I need to be specific. Ha? It is only for Westergren ESR. Okay, Westergren ESR, we use your block top tube. And unlike the other citrate, your light blue top, which has a blood to anticoagulant ratio of 9 is to 1, the blood to anticoagulant ratio for block top tube is 4 is to 1. Four parts blood, one part anticoagulant. That is for your black top tube. Again, blood to anticoagulant ratio is 4 is to 1. And this is exclusively for your Westergren ESR. ESR, which means your erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Okay, much of your ESR this week in your um, hematology laboratory. But please do remember for your black top tube, we are using that for your Westergren ESR with a blood to anticoagulant ratio of 4 is to 1. With that, that ends now our discussion for today. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, Thank you so much for listening. So if you have any questions or clarification, feel free to send me a message by the end of this meeting. So thank you so much for listening and please do prepare for your quiz next meeting for... Um, your specimen collection phlebotomy and also patient preparation. So with that, thank you so much for listening. Um, have a nice and great day ahead of you. A great week ahead of you. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you on our next class. Bye.